I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and and enjoy enjoy the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. P.U., everybody. <laughs> you said it. It smells funny. Yeah, it smells funny. It might have been funny. legend. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was legend's mom. We were just talking about anal and doing anal, and I'm going straight to it because we can. <laughs> this is shameless sex, y'all. Amy was telling me about some experience she had this morning, and then I was like, we both had good mornings. I got DP'd this morning. <laughs> and, then, and then Amy's like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, but then the only thing is you get super gassy afterward. And she's like, did you let him jizz in your ass? <laughs> I was like, oh, you're not supposed to do that? No, I mean, it. you can do it. It's just so then I accidentally had a little toot. Yeah. There's the a residuals. Reason. There's of the another left. If, if that, there's a reason not to have jizz in your ass. <laughs> there you go. I'm about to start a podcast. And I'm like, oh, no. my God. And he's like, my mouth was open. <laughs> So oh. I just told you shamelessly about what a morning that, though you got yeah. Yeah, D- yeah tell D-P'd. about tell your story. Yes, I got a text message that said I had a meeting that got canceled, and uh, can I come over? And I had some uh, oral sex kind of loving. He's like, can I come over and help you come? <laughs> yeah. and you're like, mm, and, you know what? That sounds nice. And I was like, cool. I have my workout class in about an hour. That's all I got. So here we go. And it was a nice morning. It was a very nice morning. Yeah, we both had good mornings. Yeah, you you got DP though. You're more. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I mean, it was very unexpected. I was yeah. like, oh hi. Yeah, that was what's going on over there? Good and for then, you. Yeah. If anyone's new to Shameless Sex and this is your first episode, you're like, Jesus. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. You're welcome. April doesn't do <laughs> DP every Tuesday morning or whatever no, day it is. No, it's actually usually rare. And with a dildo, too? Is that the other thing? Yeah. 101. It's actually a f- the Fun Factory. I don't know if they still make it. It's a the, Fun Factory toy. Um, The the oh, balls inside? No, no, no. It's a vibrator that has a curve. I, I can't the believe it. Delight. Like, no. You would think everything's the delight, by the way. Right You're like the delight. They don't make that one anymore. Um, That's what you just said. Okay, the one anyways. with the with the cr- little bit, it's like has ridges and it's anal safe and it has curvature at the end of it. Mm, oh, I can't remember the name of it. mom would know. I helped design that thing and I just can't remember it. Mom. Doesn't matter. Oh, oh the Moody. The Moody. 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 M-O-O-D-Y. Um, I don't know if they make that anymore. I don't either, but it, it's great. It's a great toy. It's a great, we love fun bu- it's a great butt toy. Yeah. And because it has the ridges, so you can kind of move it around. Yeah. I yeah, have, I, I love have. I love all fun factors. They still have the tiger. Those yeah. are ridged. Tiger is great. Yeah, a little different kind of ridge. Uh, everyone, if you want to check out Fun Factory, go to purepleasureshop.com. Our listeners get 15% off with coupon code SHAMELESSSEX in all caps. Okay, anyways, everyone. So, welcome to Shameless Sex Podcast. To start, we are going to dive into a sex question and then we'll read a bio. This uh, episode we recorded actually weeks upon weeks ago is an awesome episode, packed full of information. It's called Conscious Uncoupling. Um, and Catherine Woodward Thomas created this this term, this concept, wrote a book called Conscious Uncoupling and then became famous through Gwyneth Paltrow talking Do about doing be, it with her partner. it would be like a methodology almost? Yeah, that makes sense. And it doesn't just apply to, uh, you know, people who are getting divorced. It doesn't just apply. To, I think I think this is for everyone. This can be for any sort of breakup, any sort of separation. Yeah. Or maybe you're not doing that right now, but in the future you might. Or in the past, if you have, then there's Stay a lot tuned, of Stay tuned because she coached me through a little bit of yeah. my stuff. And she's also a, a master manifester, too. So it, there's other aspect, things that she does that is not just about breakups and conscious uncoupling. She's, she's incredible. She's a wonderful she, speaker. Yeah, she really is. Yeah, I just confused the podcast today. 
It's been a long week. April <laughs> and I just got back from Germany. We didn't even record a podcast while we were in Germany, by the way. No, I know. We, oh, thank God our brains were, were fried. We were busy the whole time. We barely had time to eat. But we did go to Paris and we got to tour all around Paris for a day. If you don't follow us on Instagram, follow Shameless Sex Podcast on Instagram and check out some of our photos in the Tour Eiffel. Oh, you can see us riding a bull. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's in Germany. Germany yeah. <laughs> that's what they do in Germany, riding, s- riding a mechanical bull. I still have a bruise in my leg from that shit. Amy was sore for two days walking with a lamp. I know. She was like, I'm so sore. My inner what? thigh. My inner thighs, or yeah, I was like, oh, it was the bull. It was the bull. It was the big plastic bull that we rode, and I still have this massive bruise on there. So, uh, Arnica. Yeah, or, and it's a fun conversation with lovers. Like, I swear it was the bull. Okay, Arnica helps your bruises heal faster. I'm a bruiser, so I kind of like me some bruises though, because I like to see the evidence. But no, well, hmm, not bull the mechanical not, bull. Yeah, not the but we rode it good. Okay, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Testi- not the first time, though. All right. <clears throat> Testimonial. This is from a listener. Thank you, listener, who loves us. Listener says, I can't thank you enough for your amazing podcast. I've been separated for seven months after a 22-year nearly sexless marriage and now rediscovering my sexuality. There is so much about myself I had no idea existed, being told I was frigid in the bedroom for years. Really didn't help with my sexual self-esteem. I have now found a partner who allows me to explore and has taught me so much in our short time together and makes me feel like the sexiest woman in the world. I'm 43 and he is 57 and I'm having the best sex of my life. And guess what? Turns out I'm not frigid. Thank you for your podcast. I have listened, taken mental notes and practiced what I have heard. I even lost my anal virginity at 43. I really enjoyed the latest episode with Joan Price. It makes me excited for my sexual future. Keep doing what you're doing. You ladies are informative, hilarious, relatable. Thank you. Happy anal anniversary! Whenever you, whenever you gave your in, your anal virginity. Oh my God! Giving that could be your, your anniversary. Son of, it's not a fucking present, dude. Jeez. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> though now they can have an anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, we, we we have yours in my shared calendar. Is it January? January fourteenth. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh, it's coming up soon. <laughs> what should I get you? It's year two. We could do a huge butt plug. Uh, thank you, <laughs> listener. We love hearing these things. And you know, if you are new to our podcast, we read uh, testimonials that are um, positive, but we also read when people have uh, some constructive criticism too. We love hearing from you, and um, we like five stars on iTunes if you write reviews for us. And if you have some criticism, you're always welcome to send Operative us an email. Is constructive. Constructive. And you can if always, you want us yeah. to jump off a bridge, you can just keep that to yourselves nope. because nope, nope. sometimes I feel like jumping off a bridge. No, I, I wish know. you would step back from that ledge, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. All right, Shay, are you ready for a sex card? Who is that? Um, I don't remember. Wait. Wait. Oh, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I had this. I had this CD form at some point. Oh my god! It'll come it's, to us. Do you remember? It was. Oh, I, uh, wait, no, that's always. It was a Jim Carrey movie where he was singing it um, uh, to some guy. Oh my god! And that's what I thought about when I was thinking about him. This guy committing suicide. It's not funny, I, but um, the movie was funny. Okay, now it's gonna. Now I want to know. Everybody, so there's some people out there that are like, I know what it is. Okay, anyways, <clears throat> sex question. Third Eye Blind. Yes. Uh-huh. Booyah. I didn't Good even Google job. it. <laughs> I was going to say Blink 182. It's like, no. It's a third whole, Eye Blind. Yeah. 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 Third Eye Blind. I had that CD. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Tangents. I would understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm done. I'm all done. Right, you're done. Sex question. <clears throat> First of all, thank you. My partner suggested your podcast to me after he listened to an episode trying to learn more about female pleasure and eating pussy. And since then, we've become devoted listeners and it has completely revolutionized our sex life. My question is about something that turns us both on, but never would have had the openness and confidence to express to each other before listening to your podcast and aren't really sure how to incorporate it into sex. We both find it incredibly erotic to think about him getting me pregnant during sex, even though we have absolutely no desire for this to happen anytime soon. I think we are both still a little skittish about it because it feels pretty taboo, and we haven't really heard this being a thing for others. We want to know, is this normal or common? And if you have any sexy ideas on how to incorporate it without just saying, I'm going to get you pregnant during penetration or thinking in our heads. Thank you, and we love you guys. So mm. I, I this question... Because I have, a, you know, a friend or two right now. You know, I'm 34 and they're around my age. And uh, I don't have the old biological clock ticking. I have, like, puppy fever, but I definitely don't have baby fever. But I have some friends right now who are either in relationships or not 
that are so turned on by the idea of being pregnant. They actually do want to get pregnant, these people I'm talking about. And some of them are not even with partners, and so they're not even in a place where they're uh, trying to get pregnant with someone, but the idea is like they they literally masturbate to the idea. So um, I think that this is completely normal to find it really hot. There's also, I think we talked about this with Kristen on the podcast once, um, where there's something, okay, yeah, because someone had a pregnancy fetish. Oh, An episode yeah. with the, it was the pegging fisting episode with Kristen, and someone was asking, yeah, a pregnancy fetish, is that normal? And this is, so, you know, I think it was a... Um, a sex cis, question? Yeah, cis man yeah. asking this. Oh, that's right. I do remember that. And so, and we were saying on there that um, pregnancy and childbirth is like the ultimate powerful act of creation and like you know as a uh, a vulva owner they are like the ultimate badassery like the creator of life and so there's like some awesome fucking power in that that i can see why it's super hot there's also like we're creating together even if it's something you don't want to do i can see why it can be super hot eroticized or fetishized and um, whether you want to do it or not, a lot of erotic things or or fetishes aren't things that people actually necessarily always wanted to do per se. There can be just be an idea or a concept and you can be super turned on by it. So um, I've totally heard of this from people. I've heard of it from you know singles. I've heard of this from couples and you're completely normal. Yeah. I say if it turns you on and it. you are it's you're not hurting anyone, obviously, in it what the power of thought and mm-hmm. putting the energy out there. Get it. Yeah. Get all of it. And put that, put stuff a basketball onto your shirt. Yeah, do whatever. There you, go. Yeah. you could do some Get one of those play. fake baby bumps and I like, come back home and be like, hey, yeah. guess what? We want to put a it baby worked. in yeah. here. It worked. Yeah. yeah do it. it was, Just and, get freaky with it. Why not? And yeah, the, I mean, some other, this, so there's like the line, I'm going to get you pregnant. But I mean, you could say things like, um, you know, I, I am like, I, I want your. Like, give me your, 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 I want your seed, you know, because I'm going to yeah. get you pregnant is one, a one sided thing. But like, you know, I want like I want your I want to carry your I want to I want to make a baby with you. Yeah. And I want to have your baby. Uh-huh. And I don't know. Come on. Yeah, baby, baby. You know, I wonder. I wonder if they come on, hey, baby, baby. baby. <laughs> That's fine. And I wonder if there's. Well, for okay. me, this is a hard one because I have don't have this fetish, so I'm trying to think of things to say. Like, yeah. Come on, yeah, that's my baby. No, yeah. sir, I don't mean maybe. What I about mean, that one? I, <laughs> that's what <laughs> April would say during it. And they're like, was that sexy? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> April can make most things sexy, though. <laughs> well, and so, because one is one-sided, right? I'm going to get you pregnant. So on, on your side as being the person that uh, is receiving the, the sperm, and I don't even know, is there even, are you doing, what? I don't know what you're birth control method is here so um you know if you're doing the pull-out method then it might not you might might be able to carry it all the way through but you can really if you are on birth control or something you are allowing ejaculate in you then you can really make that moment of having the ejaculate in you and the feeling and sensation and like pretending like oh because i have heard from people they knew the minute that they were pregnant like i've heard from people who had sex and right after they're like Oh, we just got pregnant, and they wow. totally did. I've known multiple couples where this was the case. They could feel it. They're also very energetically in tune, people. Right. But I wonder if you can kind of role play into that part too, um, as to like, like, oh, I like, I can feel it. Like, I can feel that it's inside of me, and like, we did this together. And you know, however you want to play with it. <laughs> now, make sure your birth control. If you're not trying to get pregnant, make sure you have yeah, it be careful all intact. Because <laughs> yeah. if you're putting out that much energy, and yeah. To the universe, you never know what you're gonna get. I wonder what you could do if you're doing like the pull out method. If you could do some sort of like fake sperm squirt inside of you or something. Oh, I'm sure you could do like uh, a turkey that, baster. There's that dildo that uh, oh, the pop yeah. dildo. Is it called pop? It's called pop. Oh, it Fun actually, Factory makes it. Uh, it, not, it before it was from Semenette, but now Fun Factory makes it for them. And it actually, oh yeah, you can put real sperm into yeah, it. Yeah, or you could put whatever or lube some creamy, or, some yeah. creamy substance. What's it called? It's pop by Fun Factory. That's yeah. a cool idea. You, well, go look into that. I didn't, didn't even know about that. There I remember the the, sim, the yeah. seminette when it was a thing. It's the same company that does it, but uh, Fun Factory ma- manufactures it for them. All right. There you go. That's your role play kit. So there anyways, you thank you, listener. We love you. And you are normal. You're fucking awesome. Keep rocking it and have fun with your pregnancy role play. Okay. Ready for bio? Chip. I can't wait. Catherine Woodward Thomas is the author of the New York Best Ta- New York Best Times New York Times bestseller <laughs> Conscious Uncoupling 5 Steps to Living Happily Ever 
after and the national bestseller, Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life. She's also a licensed marriage and family therapist and teacher to thousands from all corners of the world in her virtual and in-person learning communities. Catherine has also trained and credentialed hundreds of people as certified conscious uncoupling coaches and as as certified calling in the one coaches. To learn more, go to Catherine, that's with a K, woodwardthomas.com. And I just want to also say when I said Conscious uncoupling, five steps to living happily ever after. It says happily even after. I think that might be right. I think it is it right. It is. I think it's uncoupling. happily even, even after. after. Yeah. yeah. Happily even after. Yeah. Good I was catch. Like, yeah. Good I was catch. Like, I didn't get that right. But, but it was a typo. Right. Interesting. Okay. Anyways. So uh, we're going to dive in the podcast. But before we do... You all know we are huge fans of erotic self-care. Whether it's as a practice to connect to your desire or perhaps you're just looking to get super aroused... We are all about finding creative ways to tap into our internal fire. Enter Dipsy. Dipsy is an audio app created with women in mind, full of short, sexy stories and guided sessions designed to turn you on. Turn off the television and stop scrolling through Instagram. It's time to get into your eroticism, and Dipsy makes it easy to get you there. No joke, I listened to Dipsy on my way home from the airport and I got so turned on that I had to rip my partner's clothes off right when I got home. Dipsy gets me turned on anywhere, anytime. Sometimes I listen just for me or I put on a hot story to heighten arousal with my partner. The possibilities are endless. And Dipsy just made tapping into your arousal even easier by offering our listeners a 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash shameless. That's a 30-day free trial when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash shameless. And now back to the show. All right, everyone. Episode time. Let's dive on in. Uh, this one is ex- extra exciting for me as you all, if, you've, if you're a regular listener on our podcast, you have heard uh, me particularly talking about my relationship. April talks about hers as well, but my last relationship that... Um, ended in a way that I had heard of this conscious uncoupling thing. I had never read the book. I didn't even know how to do it, but it just seemed like it kind of happened. But I still have questions if that's what we did. <laughs> so, um, But it just felt that that's what happened. So I'm really excited to learn more uh, about this. And um, I'm sure you all are excited to learn more as well. So let's dive right on, right on it, right in. We are with Catherine Woodward Thomas. Catherine, can you tell our listeners a little bit more about where you got to to, or how you got to be where you are today. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, I, I think I'm most known, or I was most known uh, for Calling in the One, mm. which I wrote actually, uh, Calling in the One is about how to manifest a great relationship, kind of from the inside out by removing the inner obstacles to love. And I think we all know that there are parts of us that are incongruent sometimes with the things that we actually want. There are parts of us that really maybe not don't want those things, So particularly in the areas where we struggle, that there are parts of us that are not quite aligned and in integrity with that future. So we're a little divided within ourselves. So when I was in my 40s, my early 40s, um, I decided that I wanted to uh, have a family. (laughs) I was kind of getting in at the very end there. I was 41 at the time. and 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 I was also really looking at Um, and living from the idea that we create and manifest from the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, a lot of times when we want things, we go back into the past and we try and sort through what happened, when it happened, where it happened, why it happened, try and sort that out. But there's also this principle that we can actually manifest from the future by taking a stand for something that would be, you know, kind of outside of the norm for us, kind of outrageous, a little unpredictable or a lot unpredictable, something we've never been able to really create before and just saying, this shall be so. And then living into that future, who would I need to be? Um, What would I need to let go of? What would I need to cultivate or learn or grow within myself to be the person I would need to be to have that? in my life. So that's how I was working. And, um, and so I set an intention to be engaged by my 42nd birthday. And I started living into that future. I'd never been engaged. I mean, I actually was for a brief time when I was like 16, but I don't think that really counts. <laughs> so, and, um, and, and every day I would kind of do the manifestation things that we know, and you're creating from the future, you sit up, you know, you imagine what it's like to have that thing now, 
Um, you, you kind of, that's what our vision boards are about. We're kind of trying on that life and kind of putting ourselves into the headspace of that future. And so I began to really take this seriously and every day began my meditation with what would it feel like to actually have love and to have a person who's really present for me. Cause I had this terrible pattern of unavailable people. And uh, I mean, I, it was a joke at one point. By the time I was 41, it was kind of a joke because it was like anyone who was married, anyone who was engaged, if he was an alcoholic, if he was commitment phobic, it, if he was gay and wanted to explore, mm-hmm. he was all over me. But if, <laughs> but if he was, you know, straight and available and appropriate, didn't even see me. I was just completely invisible. And I was actually really confused about this. Um, I had a lot of broken hearts. I had a lot of stop starts. I had a lot of um, a lot of impossible loves. All that characterizing my twenties and my thirties, and it just kind of felt like it was my fate to be alone. So I, but I did something outrageous. I, I just set this outrageous intention, which would kind of be a, a pattern interrupt at, at best, or, or at least at least a pattern interrupt, and really more like a miracle in my case. Um, and I called up a friend and I said, look, I'm, I'm going to manifest this. You know, I'm just going to live into this future. She said, I'm going to really hold that with you if you give me permission to hold you accountable for being the woman that you would need to be in order for that to happen. So every day I'm visualizing this. I'm kind of connecting with my intuitive knowing what would I have to give up? What would I have to begin to cultivate within myself? And of course, when you ask those kinds of questions, you really do get answers. They don't come like a burning bush, but suddenly you begin to see things. You get insights, you know, and when you're willing to take responsibility for yourself as the source of the experience, it feels like it's happening to me, but how might it be happening through me in covert and subtle ways? So one foot in front of the other, as I get off the meditation cushion, every day I get some kind of inspiration. One day it was noticing that all the art on my walls was of these forlorn, noble looking women who were all by themselves on a mountaintop kind of staring nobly into space. (laughs) It's like, oh, I should really take them down and, you know, put other images of couples and families and community and um, put pairs of things in my home. So there was like the the feng shui of of the home, which I think is really actually very important. Um, And then, but then it was deeper things. It was like, well, you know, what about the vow I made to my high school boyfriend that, you know, we couldn't be together now, but when we're in our 60s and we've made all our life choices, we'll come back together and get married again. And, or, or what about the promise I made to myself that I was never going to get hurt like that again? Or what about the way that I'm still victimized by my former boyfriend who I think did me so wrong? And, uh, and, 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 you know, how do I still not trust myself? Because maybe that could happen again, because I haven't actually taken responsibility for my part, because my focus has been so much on him. So all of these, like, subtle inconsistencies, the big inconsistency I found was on a, on a deep identity level. You know, things happen in our childhoods, and we make decisions about who we are, particularly as it relates to love. And I had like a, a really big story that I wasn't valuable in some way. And so when I saw it, I didn't need to analyze it. Um, I mean, I, there's, a, there's a time to kind of figure out who did what to when, you know, who did what to you when and how it happened and why it happened. But I think that, you know, those of us who have been doing our work at some point um, want to start looking into, well, how am I perpetuating that story? How do I show up that's actually kind of covertly communicating to people that I'm not of value, mm-hmm. that, that they don't have to actually treat me well? You know, and that's a much more valuable conversation. Mm-hmm. So as I started to see the ways that I was kind of enrolling people into an I'm not valuable story, I started to see like, oh, okay, well, what I'm going to need to develop are some boundaries, some standards, some discernment. Um, the ways that I'm going to need to grow is to really step in and own my value. Like what's really true about that? I mean, the the part of me that decided I wasn't valuable was 12. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Is it actually true? 
Well, gosh, I mean, that's not true. Any of these false beliefs, if we really look at it, it's not true. The 12 year old part of me might still be in that conversation, but certainly I have a lot of evidence to the contrary. And so who would I be if I'm not standing in that center? Well, I'd be, you know, I'd be showing up with more self-respect. I'd be showing up um, having an opinion, having needs, negotiating for my needs. So I allowed the process to transform me. And really within just a matter of weeks, I ended up in this really miraculous way reconnecting with this man who I had dated six years earlier, who for years I thought of as the one that got away. And we were engaged within a few months, married the next year. I gave birth to our daughter mm. and, um, and, and started living my happily ever after life. And then I wrote a book about it, became a national bestseller. And I started teaching and I had thousands and thousands of students. And then about 10 years in, we, my, my, now who I call my husband, and I decided to get divorced. <laughs> so I had a little PR problem on my hand for a minute there. <laughs> I like that husband. I know husband yeah. is great. You yeah, he, my husband. So, but you know, the saving grace of that was that we really decided to do it well. I mean, we both had had really, we come from homes where both our parents had had very nasty, ugly divorces. And it ended up, it resulted in each of us having parental alienation, Mm -hmm. which is where you lose contact with one of your parents. And uh, he, he lost contact with his mother when he was a baby. She left and never came back and never connected with him again. And I lost contact with my father when I was 10. So we kind of knew that, you know, it could go really badly. And we knew the impact of that. I mean, I can't speak for Mark, but I know for me, one of the biggest traumas of my life was that my father gave up parental rights when I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And all of the decisions I made about myself or, you know, that I was always going to be alone or people would always leave or I was never going to be able to count on anyone. All, All of those choices and decisions that then influenced how I made choices and how I showed up in ways that ended up duplicating that pattern. I mean, who else but someone who has like a, no one will ever be there for me would somehow be okay with being like the third wheel, Mm -hmm. you know, getting involved with married person after married person or engaged person. Because predictably those are people who really can't show up for you, particularly in a time of need. So we really do have these ways of relating that are kind of or the choices that we're making are really kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. And calling in the one is about not is about really getting conscious of those and then re-choosing mm-hmm. and growing ourselves healthier in order to manifest the kind of relationship that we actually would want to be having. Mm-hmm. So when I when we were getting um, uh, divorced, Mark and I kind of joined upon this. Um, shared commitment that our daughter was going to have a happy childhood. We just made that decision. We didn't know what it looked like. We'd never really seen other people model it. But because we had made that commitment, um, we kept bringing ourselves back to um, a place of generosity, a place of self-responsibility, a place of teamwork, working together. So we kind of, we created this whole new way to do it, which we hadn't really seen before. And that became the five steps then of conscious uncoupling. Mm -hmm. And then it got popped into the lexicon by Gwyneth Paltrow, which was. Oh, right. People thought that it was her, it was her creation or something. I know they, they still do. Oh gosh. Yeah. It's okay. Because she just said, she just talked about conscious uncoupling, right? She just said something about, about her doing a conscious uncoupling with her partner and the people thought it was something that she created, but I don't, yeah, it was a whole. Well, it's even more complex than that. You know, it's just, it's one of those things. It was um, a doctor who was uh, my natural, I don't know, natural path, I think is what you call them. I was going to, for a couple of issues, was actually a big fan of mine. So he, he had my books in his waiting, calling in the one in his waiting room. And his wife um, was my daughter's dentist. So they were very familiar with my work Mm -hmm. and uh, they were treating Gwyneth. So when Gwyneth came to them, they, um, they were talking about conscious uncoupling and, and uh, along with some other ideas that he had and had been developing, but he didn't, it didn't occur to him to mention my name or that this was a thing. So when she, 
um, when she asked him to write an explanation on his, on her website, he put into his explanation conscious uncoupling, and then the editor liked the phrase, so she titled it mm. conscious uncoupling. And uh, for, didn't think to Google it because I was kind of all over the internet at that point mm-hmm. with it. But um, so it went out it, uh, into the internet, into the ethers without my particular name. But, mm-hmm. you know, then reporters, it, it was a little bit of a drama because the New York Times called and <clears throat> the Today Show. And, you know, it, it, anybody who knows how to do research could track it back to 2010, which is when I was starting that work. So mm-hmm. anyway, it, it's been a little bit of a parallel path, but she's done a great job modeling what's really possible for people. Um, I think she's uh, very creative in the way that she it goes about her life. And I think she's done an excellent job. I think the only thing about um, that she has done that people are kind of left with a misconception is that the way that I created Conscious Uncoupling really wasn't about just two people doing this well who might have done it well anyway. Mm-hmm. It's not just another term for amicable divorce. It's really for people who are suffering mm-hmm. because breakups are a terrible trauma. They're one of the biggest traumas that, that there are, really. And uh, some some of us, you know, will will live a lesser life in the aftermath of, of a broken heart because we never want to be hurt like that again. Mm -hmm. So conscious uncoupling is actually, it could, it's sometimes done by couples together and there's a way to do it together. But it's, I'd say that over 90% of the people who do it, do it because they're in the midst of a breakup and they're really suffering because they're the ones who were left. um, And it kind of just traumatized them and they didn't really see it coming. Or even if they did, they're still pretty traumatized. Um, Or somebody still suffering with a broken heart you know, really wrestling with unresolved grief, or even someone who is wanting to end a relationship but wants to make sure it's going to go well when they do. So it's it's really kind of a container for how we can do this well because it, it's not organic for us. I've seen the most conscious people do this badly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I bet. It's like it really is our blind spot, mm-hmm. you know. We're 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 the we're the nicest people until until we break up. There's a saying in Japan: you never know your wife until you divorce her. <laughs> like there's all the sides. Uh huh. I've seen those sides of myself in breakups too. Like wow, who is this angry person? But yeah. you know, she's in there, she's fucking pissed. <laughs> so yeah. it's not just uncoupling then. The way you're describing it, it 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 can apply to marriage. It can also apply to just relationships that don't involve marriage. Um, or was it ri- specifically written for married folks? No, it's okay. it's for anyone. I anyone. mean, okay. even you know, look, tra- breakup trauma can happen for people even if they were just dating for a few dates, mm-hmm. but they somehow so invested in that connection or had so much, you know. So much of their heart in there that it, and, and the shock of someone just ghosting them, for example, and just disappearing. Mm-hmm. They can do conscious uncoupling and get a lot of value from it. Okay, y'all, time for a quick break. This podcast is made possible by some of our favorite things. Uber Lube is one of them. It's a luxurious lubricant great for all kinds of sex. It's less likely to throw off your pH than most other lubes. Seriously? There are hundreds of doctors who recommend Uber Lube to their patients, whether they want to make their hot sex even hotter or for folks who are experiencing dryness. Amy, I know you love Uber Lube too. What do you love? I love Uber Lube because it has no flavor, no scent, and it feels absolutely amazing on my body. In fact, I want it everywhere. I even use it in my hair, for my hair frizzies, for massage, and it can also prevent chafing. Oh, and the bottle is gorgeous. It's discreet and looks like a beautiful cosmetic product, so you can leave it on your nightstand shamelessly. To learn why we think it's the best lube on the planet, go check out uberlube.com. Use coupon code SHAMELESSSEX and you get 10% off and free shipping. Again, that's uberlube.com, code SHAMELESSSEX and 10% off and free shipping. This podcast was also made possible by omgs.com. OMGS is a research-based online program that helps you add more sexy things to your menu. OMGS studied thousands of vulva owners to find out how they orgasm and then made tasteful and inspiring short videos to show you techniques on how to pleasure yourself or another vulva. Amy, tell us why you love OMGS. 
I've been recommending OMGS to my clients for years and it has changed their lives. Whether you're already having good orgasms and want to have even better orgasms, or perhaps you want to explore more variety in your playtime or even learn how to pleasure someone else's vulva, OMGS will have something for you. With two seasons, one all about internal and the other all about external techniques, it's better than any book or DVD that money can buy. To learn more, visit omgs.com backslash shameless and our listeners get $5 off. That's omgs.com backslash shameless. You get $5 off. Go check it out now. And back to the show. And so it's, it's an, am I understanding the way that you're describing it then? Because yeah, I think my understanding was kind of probably more like the Gwyneth Paltrow route of, you know, okay, you have a couple that they want to break up or they are planning on breaking up and maybe it's really painful or traumatic, but they um, get really intentional about how they are severing the ties and they do so in a way that is kind of honoring um, everything that is is there, including the love, the hurt, the anger, all of it, and they honor all of that and work with all of that as opposed to the ideas that society tells them how breakups should be. You know, oh, you're broken up now, so you should be angry. You shouldn't be connected. You shouldn't still love each other. You shouldn't still respect each other. But you're actually saying that conscious uncoupling can be just one partner in, in the breakup chooses to consciously uncouple as their um, as their way of uh, working with the, the trauma or pain that's there. Yeah. See, breakups are a crossroads and um, they're going to change us. And whether they change us for the better or for the worse is kind of ours to determine. Mm-hmm. So many people, as I said, go, go on to live a lesser life in the aftermath of a heartbreak. Um, and many people go on to learn their lessons, really grow, really mature, really change in a way that enhances and expands the possibilities of love moving forward. Mm. And so conscious uncoupling is this, it, it kind of takes people through that passageway. Mm. You know, how do we be responsible when someone else wronged us? That's really hard for us. Somebody else behaves badly. They cheat on us. They lie. They steal something from us. Um, you know, they take the best years of our lives and then suddenly, you know, dump us when we're going through a hard time. You know, how do we actually, for, how do we actually get through that? How do we make meaning of that? So there's two kinds of grief, right? There's grief that we're all going to feel when we end a relationship because we have hearts that love and we're, you know, we're kind of born for bonding. Nature has designed us that way. And we're always going to feel sad when we lose an intimate relationship. And, um, and that can't really be avoided. But that's, but that's healthy, healthy grief. Where we get in trouble is, is when we go into what I call ineffective suffering. And that's when we make false meaning of the breakup. That's when we make it mean, oh, I'll always be a known, or oh, you can never trust another person, or I'm just not good in relationship. You know, and, and we get left with that. And then it starts to actually influence how we show up in our relationships moving forward. And we bring that unfinished business into the next relationship. So what conscious uncoupling does is it really puts someone at a place of completion and peace Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and where you really do grow from the experience in a way where you know this could never happen again Mm -hmm. you now understand your part I like to say it's very hard because you know we're kind of hardwired when we break up to tell and retell and retell and retell the story and to to kind of be in a state of um trying to grapple with like how someone showed up or didn't show up the way that they should have or whatever. So we'll kind of replay that story over and over, but we're telling the story from a very one-sided perspective very often. And if we go to take personal responsibility for our part, what we do is we will very often be so angry with ourselves that we'll shame ourselves or we'll do it in a way that's not growth promoting. Mm -hmm. You know, shame stunts development. So if you're shaming someone else, you're shaming yourself, no one's growing. Mm-hmm. So how do we how do we do this in a way that we're going to grow? Well, you start to you you first of all we say you know if you're upset with someone it's probably because they did behave badly. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're not negating that. Ninety seven percent the other person's fault. Yes, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I got it. Yep. What's your three percent? Because you can get your life out of the three percent. Mm-hmm. And then instead of saying you know why do I always do that? What's wrong with me? Which is basically the question most of us ask when we go to look at the 3%. We want to say, okay, exactly how did I give my power away Mm. to that person? 
What was motivating me to do that? Mm-hmm. How might they have been mirroring toxic ways that I treat myself? Mm-hmm. How did I enroll them into playing a, uh, into playing like out my old wounds from childhood? Mm-hmm. What were the subtle ways that I was communicating that I am a person to be treated poorly? Like you really have to look at those things because there's like golden nuggets there because that's where you're going to say to yourself, okay, this is what I will never do again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will always, or this is what I will always do again. I will always honor my own deeper knowing. I will never skip over the red flags again. Mm -hmm. I will never put someone, I will never martyr my own feelings and needs for the feelings and needs of others. I will always negotiate for my own needs moving forward. I will always presence myself. Like we have to really stretch to grow. And then you start doing it everywhere with your sister, with your coworkers, with your best friend. You know, you just have to start showing up in that way so that you build credibility for yourself. And in that way, the breakup then graduates you. Mm-hmm. I love that, like the graduation piece there that it's like this this uh, initiation like moving moving forward and and on because of the the accountability piece you know the asking yourself the deeper questions and then the lessons that come with that so you said there's there's five steps are these you can you name these questions deeper questions um are they those part of the steps can you give us a little clip notes part of them yeah well the, the so step one is find emotional freedom and you know for those of us who've had our hearts broken we know that there is no emotional freedom happening, <laughs> that you're kind of held captive by your broken heart, um, that you're you know, in a lot of suffering. I mean, breakups really are a trauma. Human beings are not born to break up. It's a relatively, I think it's a relatively new phenomenon, you know, and we still feel like we're going to die if we we're going to break up. So a thousand years ago, though, if you wandered away from your tribe, you probably would have died. Mm-hmm. So we still kind of have that evolutionary impulse and we go into fight or flight. We feel like our life is at stake. Um, We are what's called, what psychotherapists call deregulated by the experience because our our intimate connections regulate us emotionally. Uh, The brain is actually a social organ. And as much as we like to think of ourselves as independent creatures, the truth is we're relational creatures. So that's the phenomenon of, you know, the person who's hurt you the most is the, only, is the one you're craving to hear. And the moment you hear his or her voice on the phone, your whole body calms down, mm-hmm. even though they just did something horrific mm-hmm. last week. You know, so, so we really are, we do get addicted to each other. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a mutual thing. But we have to understand that when we're in the midst of a breakup, um, it really, we, our biology will have, have a tendency to go to war and to create what I call a soulmate to soul hate connection mm. because nature is designed to keep us together. And if we're not going to be together in a bond of love, better in nature's world, in nature's viewpoint for us to be bound by hate than to become indifferent and to actually separate. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right? So if you think about soul hate, very engaged heightened, passionate state of engagement with the other person. So the goal is, is, uh, is to, become, um, to, to become more self-contained and learn how to contain your own inner experience and talk yourself off the ledge because what, you know, whatever actions we take, whatever choices we make during a breakup, um, you know, we're going to be living, we and our children, if we have them, we'll be living with the consequences of them for many years to come. So, you know, we all want to behave from our best selves. We don't want to like, you know, be have be saddled with the memory of how badly we behaved and be horrified that someone would find out about that or, you know, be horrified that we're going to bump into that person and feel ashamed of ourselves. We don't want to grovel at someone's feet. We don't want to beg. You know, we don't we don't want to show up in these really toxic ways. We want to show up in alignment with our ethics. We're good people. We're believers in love. You know, we're decent. You know, we want to leave with dignity. And so how do we hold those emotions? So I have in, in, so in step one, find emotional freedom. I'm teaching a technique about how to hold and contain your feelings from a deeper center and how to even sponsor that which is healthy inside of anger if you're feeling anger. 
So for example, the healthy impulse like to reclaim your right. You know, I do I do have the right to be treated well. Mm-hmm. That's actually wholesome and right. That's true. And then to set my intention for that inside of myself. Like mm-hmm. this this is the last time this will ever show up again. Mm-hmm. And so you're you're kind of harnessing the intensity of your negative emotions and pointing them in a positive direction. Mm-hmm. And then it goes right into step two, uh, which is reclaim your power and your life. And power is always going to be um, associated with responsibility. Mm. How do we take personal responsibility for ourselves as the source of what happened without being overly responsible for someone else's bad behavior or without uh, beating ourselves up? And so, again, it's what I was just talking about was kind of a step two phenomenon where you're looking for your 3%. And basically what you're looking for is how can I make an amends of, you know, to myself, first and foremost, for how I showed up and gave my power away to someone. Mm. Step three, now that will lead very organically to, well, I didn't have boundaries because um, I don't think I'm worthy, mm-hmm. right? So there's a there's a deeper level going on when we behave in ways where we're kind of betraying ourselves and throwing ourselves under the bus. It's usually because there's some way that we don't believe in ourselves or we're operating out of an old wound. I mean, codependence, which is something I, I've struggled with my whole life, is really born from a feeling on a core level of I'm all alone here. And it's a very young wounding. And it's almost like a panicked kind of I'm alone here. So then there's a tendency to, you know, make sure that the relationship with other people is kind of seamless or you ingratiate yourself to them so that no one ever leaves you. So you have to come home. So you can say in step two, um, you know, I promise myself I'm never going to self-abandon again. I'm never going to just throw my own feelings and needs under the bus to try and tend to the feelings and needs of others or disappear myself to try and be the perfect person for someone. But then you have to deal with, well, what's, what's going on on a deeper level? So that's step three, which is break the pattern, heal your heart. And this is what I love about the sacred work of doing this when someone's in a breakup because they're just broken open. Mm-hmm. Like there's nowhere else to go. It's all up on the surface. Otherwise, we're kind of like, tap dancing around these things like issues from you know that we can talk about in therapy for a dec- decades really mm-hmm. you know i have this issue this codependence issue but when you really get the cost like oh this is what it costs to actually operate out of this i'm alone and how did i how you know how did i how did i actually create that the other person did leave well how about i so disappeared myself that there was no authentic person to love Right or how about I was so disconnected from myself that I self I left myself inside of this I'm alone. Mm-hmm. So then you go back in step three and you say, "What's really true about this? Are you alone?" Mm-hmm. Well, you can start to tend to that younger part in you, and you can say, "Sweetie, you're not alone. I'm right here. Mm-hmm. Your adult self is there now." And, um, and you could start to actually really own that you have the capacity to create great relationships. And if you don't know how to yet, you can certainly learn because you're a smart adult who has resources available to you. And you, know, you can learn how to root down love just like other people can. And so you start to really, you, you have to own a deeper truth and then start to look at how you've been habitually showing up and look at how you might show up opposite so that you actually can leave that old behavior behind and know that it could could never actually happen again the way that it just happened. Mm -hmm. So, and and a lot of the course corrects are pretty simple. I always presence myself. I always speak up, um, you know, and and say the thing that's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Or I always, you know, remember that no is a viable word to say. Mm And um, so, so, so that, and so then you're, you're, and then it ends with, um, step three ends with this beautiful, what I call a soul to soul meditations, where you are standing in the deeper truth of your value, your power, your integrity, 
and you imagine having that person in front of you, because sometimes we don't get to actually have these conversations face to face. And um, you, you, you show up in your imagination, in this meditation, as the truth of who you really are, mm -hmm. so that you're not left in the identity of, oh, I'm the one who's rejected, or I'm the one who's not wanted, or I'm the one who's inferior. Mm -hmm. So the first three steps of conscious uncoupling are all those internal steps. We're sorry, having some dog issues over here. <laughs> People's a dog mom. The dog the getting very excited. We're gonna we're going to let it just rock here. Um, one thing that came to mind, you, you almost you know how people fantasize all the time. I mean, not all the time, often about all the things that they're gonna say, the angry, hateful things. Like if I have a conversation with my ex and all the things about all the ways it did me wrong, and you're actually speaking to like a different conversation, right? It's like a meditation. Yeah, but that's the person I'm talking to. Like, mm -hmm. so we are meeting that person exactly where they are. Mm -hmm. And look, if that conversation worked to bring them eventually to a place of peace, mm -hmm. I'd say go for it, but yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It yeah. actually leaves people incomplete and disempowered. And then you're dragging that baggage mm -hmm. into the next relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call it. You know, you're living, you're, you're living your lesser life you're you're showing up as a dim down version of yourself your your heart's gonna heal but it'll heal a little too crooked and a little too close and a little too easily bruised moving forward so you don't want to just let time do do the healing mm -hmm. it's like look we wouldn't let our legs our broken legs just heal of their own accord mm -hmm. right yeah. so conscious I, I always think of conscious uncoupling as you know just a kind of the version of the of the cast that we're going to put the leg into mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so so the last two steps are actually uh dealing with your former partner mm, okay the okay. quest <laughs> it's you first I like yes that. Yeah. you've you got first. to manage yourself first mm -hmm. you've got to deal with what's going on with you first mm -hmm. and get into your power mm -hmm. You know, and the truth and the integrity with what you really believe and what you're here for, and who you really are, and then show up from that place. And step four, I call it becoming a love alchemist. It's probably my favorite part of the program mm -hmm. um, because it's doing almost the opposite of what the instinct wants to do, which is to take down the other person or to punish them or expose them and turn people against them, which are all very natural, organic things to feel. But if you really understand what's happening when we're gossiping about someone or turning the community against someone, um, it's pretty serious mm -hmm. because it's actually a form of violence. Rejection in brain studies show that rejection will light up the same centers of the brain as uh, physical pain. Mm -hmm. So when we cause other people to reject that person, we're, it, it's actually a form of violence. So we have, you know, we're just kind of, all of our primitive parts are up. Mm -hmm. So what, so what this, this step is about is how do we forgive in a way that's genuine, in a way that actually clears the air, mm -hmm. it completes something. And I think that a lot of us have been trying to do that. Those of us who kind of organically try and do conscious uncoupling, uh, very often do this and the, the trap we'll fall into is let me explain why I behaved the bad way that I behaved. Let me just tell you how my mother did that to my father, or my father did it to me, or I only did that because you did X, Y, Z, and we're trying to somehow get to the bottom of it. But those explanations rarely, if ever, really complete things in a way where there's no more residue in the field. So I have a, an exercise in step four that really helps people to, to empathize with each other, to uh, extend, uh, let, let your heart be touched by the impact of your behavior on the other person, and then find a way to make an amends. Even if the amends is, I can't make this better for you, but I got it. And I will never do that again to another person. Now we're in the realm of re real repair. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's true repair happening here. That's where, you know, particularly if you have kids, you've got to do that work. Because kids are little energy sponges. And if you've got a lot of hurt feelings incomplete in the field, they're going to feel that. Mm -hmm. And even adult kids. I'm going to say that for adult kids. Because just because we're grown doesn't mean that we don't need, you know, to have our relational home intact. It's fine to end a marriage. Why, you know, we came up with this term broken homes is because um, the relational field is broken as opposed to transitioned. Mm -hmm. 
which is what Gwyneth did beautifully, mm-hmm. really, Gwyneth and Chris. So, um, so step four also has in it uh, acts of generosity, which really transform things. And they can be small. I mean, they can be big ones, like you're going to give a financial gift, or you're going to be generous as you're negotiating your settlement. But it can be just as simple as, oh, here's your favorite soup when you're sick. And one woman I was working with, um, her former husband was really nasty to her because he was really narcissistic. And a lot of us are breaking up with people who are not very nice when they break up and don't have the same ethic of doing this well. And that's really hard, particularly if you have children. So she was in that situation. And she, but what she did really well is when he got sick, she called up his girlfriend that he was living with and she gave the girlfriend his favorite soup recipe. Mm -hmm. And it calmed everybody down. Mm -hmm. It was just a gesture of reconciliation. It was building the new form of family. She had to be a really big person to do it. But she became the leader of love. And I think that when other people are behaving badly, um, it's really a spiritual challenge to, to not respond in kind. Because if you do, we're giving our power to that person to determine who we are going to be. And we never want to give someone with a lesser consciousness the power to determine who we are. Mm-hmm. So that's what step four is dealing with. And it's really about transforming the field between you to one of peace Whether or not you're going to see that person, you still need to be at peace. Merritt Malloy said, relationships that do not end peacefully do not end at all. Mm. So it's very important, even if it's somebody who behaved badly, you don't want to see them again, to do this work within yourself to get to a place of peace where you can even remember maybe that person is the catalyst for your transformation. Um, You might think of that person as your dark guru who taught you uh, about your power, right? Your true power to never give your power away to anyone again. You know, all of that stuff really. And, and I think sometimes we need these kinds of wake up calls to really stop living a, a, a lesser version of who we are that we came up with in childhood and to really, you know, start to show up as the powerful, amazing human beings that we are. I just want to ask you, I haven't, you've been answering all of my questions without me even saying a word. I was like, oh, she just answered that. So it's been beautiful to to listen to everything you're offering. And um, thank you. And I have a question that number four kind of pertains to my previous relationship. And I have felt a calling to sort of, uh, to make amends with that. Is that something that you feel people, if, if, the person that was hurt, which is the, my um, ex or my husband, um, and I'm not sure how I would be received by him. Even even now, it's been years. Is that something that I should just make peace with within myself and write him a, a letter, or do something that would uh, give me closure, or should I actually call him and try to sort of make peace with it that way? Did he ask you to not contact him? At some point? No, he's never asked me not to contact him. Although every time we did have contact, I felt like it was really, um, it was hurting his heart. And I didn't want to put him through that anymore Mm -hmm. uh, because he really wanted to be with me. And I didn't think that it was a good idea for us to get back together. So that was the whole thing. And so it's been years now and not to turn this around in, into my yeah. story. I just was curious for your expertise in that because I, a lot of what you're saying resonates with me and I do practice a very conscious existence. And that one piece of my life is something that I want to heal because as you just said, it's not over until it's really, until it's, it, yeah. until it's that, at that level that. Of well, so can I ask, is it too personal to ask what the amends would be? Uh, ooh. Uh, I think that I want to just have a situation where I could, if I were in, uh, he doesn't live in this country. If I were to see him and I was to be in his country, we could have dinner or I could meet his girl. I would be totally into meeting his new partner or his children when he has children. And I don't know if that's too much to ask. Uh, and I don't know if that's even ever going to be on the table. I don't know if I'll ever be in his country again. But I, I think the amends would be uh, you, uh, that thank you for the beautiful years that we spent together. 
and for opening my heart to, to things that I never even knew possible. And I will always love you deeply and care about the human that you are. And I, so I just thank you. That's it. That, and so, it's, so it's almost like just an incomplete communication. Like you haven't gotten to say that to him. I'm almost but, fearful but, of what he will say. Like well, so, so an amends would be, so how I'm talking about amends, an amends would be, I married him knowing that I never really loved him. I'm just giving an example, right? I'm not saying this is you. Okay. But I married him knowing that I didn't really love him um, because I was uh, feeling fragile and unsafe and he seemed to offer security. And so there was an inauthenticity. And now I can see the cost to another human being mm. because he pledged his whole being and gave his soul to me and I didn't actually really even love him. So then the amends for that is going to be, I'm going to be much more precious with people's hearts moving forward. I'm going to be more in integrity. I'm going to come into my power and know that I can always take care of myself. I never need to use someone again. Right. So that's more the realm of an amends. This is more like actually a request. This is more what I'm hearing from you. It's more like, um, I think of you fondly. I hold you in my heart. I pray for your happiness all the time. Um, I know that uh, it seems to me that it's been painful in the past for you to be connected. So I honor your, your, um, your request or your desire to not be connected. However, it would be my desire to be friends and so that I could visit you and we could occasionally do a catch up and I can still be a part of your life. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Right? I like that. I yeah. Like that. Also, I, I do feel what, what you, the example person that you used, it, there are pieces of that. I always loved him. I, I do feel so much love for him. And I, 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 divorce is so hard because it is just a breakup with paperwork, right? And people think of it as the, the ultimate failure. And for me, I always, because I also grew up in a family of broken parents that were alienating each other all the time and, and it was terrible. So I never wanted to get married. So now that that happened and I feel like I failed, there's fear in me going backwards and, and actually looking into myself and feeling like, why, why did it fail? And getting re real about it. But the amends portion, I, I'm going to listen to this podcast again and, and yeah. write down and read the book too. Uh, although my partner, my partner now would be like, why are you reading Conscious Uncoupling? What's going on? What to know about. But thank you. Thank you for those uh, words of advice. I really appreciate that. Too. Well, in the amends thing, I just want to say it sounds, it's a, it sounds and it's accountability piece. You know, like what is, what is, you're talking about that, that 3% there's, there's. Well, like, and look, you know, to go back at this point and say, I'm sorry that I married you, you know, having these mixed motives. I mean, part of me kind of loved you, but I didn't love you as much as I should have. Like, like that would probably be self-indulgent. Yeah, yeah. Right. You have to really think about like how it's going to land for somebody. He knows that, by the way. That's why he's had, it's painful for him. Yeah. He knows that. So the amends is moving forward from this moment forward, I will never do that to another human being. Mm -hmm. It's how you live your life is the amends. I did make a commitment to when that, when yeah. that failed. I was like, I'm always going to live in integrity with people that I love in general. And I have been, I've been really excellent with following that. Mm -hmm. That's I beautiful. To, yes, I plan yeah. to keep on the path. Well, there's so much integrity to that. There's a lot of dignity and honor. Mm -hmm. And we all learn, you know, through mm -hmm. our mistakes like that. It's yeah. the best, the best way we learn. But I want to speak to um, the word failure because you've used it at least six times. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I heard that. I was like, "Oh yeah, shit!" She said the f word. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. She's in trouble with Mama Cat. <laughs> <laughs> Mama Cat is mad. <laughs> yeah. All right. So first of all, happily ever after was created. Um, about 400 years ago in Venice, Italy, mm -hmm. um, when the lifespan was less than 40 years of age, and when people were locked into kind of a very, um, a very kind of miserable class structure, where they had no hope of ever getting out of poverty if they were born into poverty, because there was even a law on the books at the time that said a noble person could not marry a commoner. 
And if you notice all the happily ever after stories end with a noble, a noble person marrying a commoner and lifting all of these commoners, they all lived happily ever after out of deep suffering. And people were really, really suffering. Uh, but it was, and they were, so if they, if people were born into poverty, they were most definitely going to d- live their life in poverty and die in poverty. Half the children were dying before they were 16 years of age. So there was, a, and nobody left. Like, you know, it's not like we get on a plane today and we just go to live in another country. You know, you were born in there. That's where you lived your life. So you have to understand that every kind of cultural paradigm comes out of the life conditions of a particular time. So I, one of the things that I've been saying with conscious uncoupling is as we constantly review our eating practices, our diets, our exercise habits, our child rearing practices, you know, all of these things, we also have to actually consider that happily ever after is kind of outstated its purpose. I mean, the lifespan is doubled in the last 100 years. And with Viagra and hormone therapies, people are having wildly delicious sex up into their 80s and 90s. I mean, it's like, you know, we live in a really different time than people who lived in Venice, Italy in the 16th century. So, um, you know, the, I think we need to rethink what what it means when we separate. I, for me, the only failure is, is ending it badly. Mm-hmm. That's really the only failure of love. Mm-hmm. And I think that people can, I think it's a growing edge for us in humanity to learn how to do this well. I think it seems to be uh, an idea whose time has come. I, it's in the news a lot now, people doing this well. Um, we don't need to damage each other, damage ourselves, damage our children any longer. And I have to tell you, I mean, I'm older than you guys, and I love I love your generation because I see it so much, there's so much integrity. I mean, even what you were saying, Amy, before... I think it was before we hopped on the call that you had had a pretty conscious uncoupling and you think you did that well. It's it's just a value that your generation is holding that I'm so moved by. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it felt, it was, yeah, with, with my uh, ex-partner, we had a lot of pain and you know, roller coaster, a lot of hurt and, you, and got so much of it. And, um, and just, it was just, we had our, you know, fifth round of kind of the same painful story. And, um, you know, and I, but first when it happened, I'm throwing all this stuff out the window and get the fuck out, you know, that person. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of yeah, course. yeah, throw all that stuff out and, yes. and then spend a couple of days really like with myself and doing the work and, and asking a deeper question of like, why am, why am I so attached to this person needing to be my partner? Like, why, why is that so important for, for me and also so scary when we're already not living together and we're already living these somewhat separate lives in these ways and it's not working. Why do I, why do I, what in me is so afraid of letting that go? And, and then all of a sudden I just had this light bulb, like, wait, I can still love them and not have them as my partner. Like that's possible. We can still wow. really love each other because we do. That didn't end. We never stopped loving each other. It's just that we didn't work as partners anymore. We tried all the things and and it just started to unfold that way. We were already kind of out there beings just based on all the things that we do and the, the way that we live. And um, yeah, it just unfolded that way where, we're, you know, and we were just at Burning Man together and still like, if you saw us, it looks like we still just love each other so much, but we are not in a partnership. We are not romantic. We are not having sex. We're not building a life together. But we love each other to endlessly and you know we own our shit of how we could have been better and how you know what we will do differently what we've learned we look at each other as our greatest teachers um and we've hurt each other a lot and still look at each other in that way so it's been really um yeah really beautiful and also we're not the easiest but um yeah it's been really great but i want to because we have to wrap up soon what is the fifth step step. (laughs) well the fifth step is create your happy even after life and and that's really about setting up structures that are win-win. Mm-hmm. Like my my husband and I, my daughter just went to college last week, so I'm like doing the empty nest thing this <laughs> week. But <laughs> she just went to college. But but for the last four years, we've lived in the same apartment building, uh, on uh, in this and and just on different floors. You so and your we, husband? Yeah, my oh. husband and I. I actually kind of downsized mm-hmm. to go, to do it which is fine because I think, you know, I value relationship more than I value things. So I was happy to do it, even though I'm kind of, you know, restless to now leave soon (laughs) and 
get a house, which is what I really want. But um, but it was great because we had a, a wonderful structure that was really organized around our daughter's well-being mm. so that she wouldn't have to choose between us. And, you know, it's creating uh, what I call an expanded family. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think of, you know, if you're going to get divorced and you have children, the ideal is to do it in a way where you're kind of reconfiguring the family. You're not you're not breaking the family up. You're not asking your children to go from one home and then to another home where they have two different families. Studies have shown that uh, it's not divorce that damages children. It's actually bad breakups and unresolved hostilities between the parents. And um, studies also show that when children are kind of shepherded back and forth, even if it's kind of on a friendly level, a friendly but disengaged level, that the children are always in a state of loss very often because they're losing one family in one home to then go join another constantly. So conscious uncoupling is kind of inviting the adults to do the work and not asking our children who sometimes appear to be more resilient than they actually are. Um, And in order to do to do this, to be, you know, brave enough to really think holistically and to think responsibly for the children that you've brought into the world, you actually have to, to, to renegotiate the agreements between yourself and your former partner. So the step five begins by looking at the agreements. And so just, you know, the agreements uh, that we have are really the fabric of relationship. You will always be my primary person. I promise sexual fidelity to you. I, you know, I will always drop everything or you can always come to me for money or, you know, there's, there's ways that we, could even say that relationship is all, all it is, is a series of agreements that we enter into with each other. And when people go through um, a traumatic breakup that kind of is prolonged in its grief or upset, you know, the phenomenon of, you know, when your former partner then finds a new partner kind of, or, you know, it's their wedding day and you start, you know, feeling upset and angry, it's because some part of us is still holding on to an incomplete agreement from the past relationship. Mm. So, so we complete these agreements, you know, I am no longer going to be sexually faithful. And it's, it's an internal process. You, it's obvious. You don't always have to say things like this to other people. But, you know, now on, I bless you to have a sexual partner other than me. And I bless myself to have a sexual partner other than you. And we are no longer lovers but we can be friends. We, we choose to be friends in this case with you and your former sweetheart. Mm-hmm. So you're just getting, you're just getting conscious about all of it so that, because a lot of times happiness studies are about our expectations. What do we expect to happen? Mm-hmm. And, and if what we expect is happening, we're happy. And if what we expect is not happening, we're unhappy. And a lot of the unhappiness after relationship has to do with not really naming, oh, that was the expectation. I'm going to change what I'm expecting here Mm -hmm. so that we're setting ourselves and everybody up to be happy moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, there is so much juicy information that you just provided us. Uh, (laughs) Can you tell uh, our listeners, our folks that are out there in listening world where they can find you, work with you? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, Consciousuncoupling.com or katherinewoodwardthomas.com. And I think both of them, you can access the Conscious Uncoupling Starter Kit just to get you started. There's an excerpt from the book and there's some uh, video meditations that I lead people through. So I, I've, I've tried to really create a, um, a package for people where they can get started right away. Perfect. And, and do you do, so you do, because you said you work, you work with people, you do uh, like retreats or is there um, more intensive... I- You know, I have a wonderful retreat coming up, a wonderful workshop called the True You Awakening Event. And that goes right to the transformation of our core identity that we were talking about, those core beliefs. And that's in October in LA. Um, If you go to katherinewoodwardthomas.com, information about that will come up. And I also have a Conscious Uncoupling Coach training that's starting up this fall in October. And um, people want to find out about that they can also go to katherinewoodwardthomas.com and or calling uh, consciousuncoupling.com awesome hopefully uh, you all can uh, go to Catherine's website it's Catherine with a k too and uh, just in case you're wondering and 
Last but not least, we did speak about something juicy. What about something juicy and jammy like wine? <laughs> Ooh, if you haven't checked out Margins Wine, y'all go to marginswine.com. It's locally made Santa Cruz, really special varietals of grapes that aren't seen every day. See why Amy and I have loved it for over two years now. There's a reason. We drink that wine. So marginswine.com. Sign up for her newsletter. You'll love the wine. Catherine, thank you so much. So much. Yes. We absolutely, thank you. Yeah, it was amazing having you on the show. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right. All right. Lots of love. Lots Bye-bye. of love. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in every Tuesday. We will see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.